the polity of the lacedaemonians by xenophon translated by h g dakins parts eight through fifteen part eight but to proceed we are all aware that there is no state in the world in which greater obedience is shown to magistrates and to the laws themselves than sparta but for my part i am disposed to think that lycurgus could never have attempted to establish this healthy condition until he had first secured the unanimity of the most powerful members of the state i infer this for the following reasons in other states the leaders in rank and influence do not even desire to be thought to fear the magistrates such a thing they would regard as in itself a symbol of servility in sparta on the contrary the stronger a man is the more readily does he bow before constituted authority and indeed they magnified themselves on their humility and on a prompt obedience running or at any rate not crawling with laggard step at the word of command such an example of eager discipline they are persuaded set by themselves will not fail to be followed by the rest and this is precisely what has taken place it is reasonable to suppose that it was these same noblest members of the state who combined to lay the foundation of the ephorate after they had come to the conclusion themselves that of all the blessings which a state or an army or a household can enjoy obedience is the greatest since as they could not but reason the greater the power with which men fence about authority the greater the fascination it will exercise upon the mind of the citizen to the enforcement of obedience accordingly the ephors are competent to punish whomsoever they choose they have power to extract fines or the spur of the moment they have power to depose magistrates in mid-career nay actually to imprison them and bring them to trial on the capital charge entrusted with these vast powers they do not as do the rest of states allow the magistrates elected to exercise authority as they like right through the year of office but in the style rather of despotic monarchs or presidents of the games at the first symptom of an offence against the law they inflict chastisement without warning and without hesitation but of all the many beautiful contrivances invented by lycurgus to enkindle a willing obedience to the laws in the hearts of the citizens none to my mind was happier or more excellent than his unwillingness to deliver his code to the people at large until attended by the most powerful members of the state he had betaken himself to delphi and there made inquiry of the god whether it were better for sparta and conducive to her interests to obey the laws which he had framed and not until the divine answer came better will it be in every way did he deliver them laying it down as a last ordinance that to refuse obedience to a code which had the sanction of the pythian god himself was a thing not illegal only but profane part nine the following two may well excite our admiration for lycurgus i speak of the consummate skill with which he induced the whole state of sparta to regard an honourable death as preferable to an ignoble life and indeed if any one will investigate the matter he will find that by comparison with those who make it a principle to retreat in face of danger actually fewer of these spartans die in battle since to speak truth salvation it would seem attends on virtue far more frequently than on cowardice virtue which is at once easier and sweeter richer in resource and stronger of arm than her opposite and that virtue has another familiar attendant to wit glory needs no showing since the whole world would fain ally themselves after some sort in battle with the good yet the actual means by which he gave currency to these principles is a point which it were well not to overlook 
it is clear that the lawmaker set himself deliberately to provide all the blessings of heaven for the good man and a sorry and ill-starred existence for the coward in other states the man who shows himself base and cowardly wins to himself an evil reputation and the nickname of a coward but that is all for the rest he buys and sells in the same marketplace as the good man he sits beside him at play he exercises with him in the same gymnasium and all as suits his humor but at lacedaemon there is not one man who would not feel ashamed to welcome the coward at the common mess table or to try conclusions with such an antagonist in a wrestling bout consider the day's round of his existence the sides are being picked up in a football match but he is left out as the odd man there is no place for him during the choric dance he is driven away into ignominious quarters nay in the very streets it is he who must step aside for others to pass or being seated he must rise and make room even for a younger man at home he will have his maiden relatives to support in isolation and they will hold him to blame for their unwedded lives a hearth with no wife to bless it that is a condition he must face and yet he will have to pay damages to the last farthing for incurring it let him not roam abroad with a smooth and smiling countenance let him not imitate men whose fame is irreproachable or he shall feel on his back the blows of his superiors such being the weight of infamy which is laid upon all cowards i for my part am not surprised if in sparta they deem death preferable to a life so steeped in dishonor and reproach part ten that too was a happy enactment in my opinion by which lycurgus provided for the continual cultivation of virtue even to old age by fixing the election to the council of elders as a last ordeal at the goal of life he made it impossible for a high standard of virtuous living to be disregarded even in old age so too it is worthy of admiration in him that he lent his helping hand to virtuous old age thus by making the elders sole arbiters in the trial of life he contrived to charge old age with a greater weight of honor than that which is accorded to the strength of mature manhood and assuredly such a contest as this must appeal to the zeal of mortal man beyond all others in a supreme degree fair doubtless are contests of gymnastic skill yet are they but trials of bodily excellence but this contest for the seniority is of a higher sort it is an ordeal of the soul itself in proportion therefore as the soul is worthier than the body so must these contests of the soul appeal to a stronger enthusiasm than their bodily antitypes and yet another point may well excite our admiration for lycurgus largely it has not escaped his observation that communities exist where those who are willing to make virtue their study and delight fail somehow in ability to add to the glory of their fatherland that lesson the legislator laid to heart and in sparta he enforced as a matter of public duty the practice of virtue by every citizen and so it is that just as man differs from man in some excellence according as he cultivates or neglects to cultivate it this city of sparta with good reason outshines all other states in virtue since she and she alone has made the attainment of a high standard of noble living a public duty and was this not a noble enactment that whereas other states are content to inflict punishment only in cases where a man does wrong against his neighbor lycurgus imposed penalties no less severe on him who openly neglected to make himself as good as possible for this it seems was his principle in the one case where a man is robbed or defrauded or kidnapped and made a slave of the injury of the misdeed whatever it is 
is personal to the individual so maltreated but in the other case whole communities suffer foul treason at the hands of the base man and the coward so that it was only reasonable in my opinion that he should visit the heaviest penalty upon these latter moreover he laid upon them like some irrepressible necessity the obligation to cultivate the whole virtue of a citizen provided they duly performed the injunctions of the law the city belonged to them each and all in absolute possession and on an equal footing weakness of limb or want of wealth was no drawback in his eyes but as for him who out of cowardice of his heart shrank from the painful performance of the law's injunction the finger of the legislator pointed him out as there and then disqualified to be regarded longer as a member of the brotherhood of peers it may be added that there was no doubt as to the great antiquity of this code of laws the point is clear so far that lycurgus himself is said to have lived in the days of the heraclidae but being of so long standing these laws even at this day still are stamped in the eyes of other men with all the novelty of youth and the most marvelous thing of all is that while everybody is agreed to praise these remarkable institutions there is not a single state which cares to imitate them part eleven the above form a common stock of blessings open to every spartan to enjoy alike in peace and in war but if any one desires to be informed in what way the legislator improved upon the ordinary machinery of warfare and in reference to an army in the field it is easy to satisfy his curiosity in the first instance the ephors announce by proclamation the limit of age to which the service applies for cavalry and heavy infantry and in the next place for the various handicraftsmen so that even on active service the lacedaemonians are well supplied with all the conveniences enjoyed by people living as citizens at home all implements and instruments whatsoever which an army may need in common are ordered to be in readiness some on wagons and others on baggage animals in this way anything omitted can hardly escape detection for the actual encounter under arms the following inventions are attributed to him the soldier has a crimson colored uniform and a heavy shield of bronze his theory being that such an equipment has no sort of feminine association and is altogether most warrior-like it is most quickly burnished it is least readily soiled he further permitted those who were above the age of early manhood to wear their hair long for so he conceived they would appear of larger stature more free and indomitable and of a more terrible aspect so furnished and accoutred he divided his citizen soldiers into six morai or regimental divisions of cavalry and heavy infantry each of these citizen regiments political divisions has one pole march or colonel four locagoi or captains of companies eight pentaconters or lieutenants each in command of half a company and sixteen inomotarchs or commanders of sections at the word of command any such regimental division can be formed readily either into enomities that is single file or into threes that is three files abreast or into sixes that is six files abreast as to the idea commonly entertained that the tactical arrangement of the laconian heavy infantry is highly complicated no conception could be more opposed to fact for in the laconian order the front rank men are all leaders so that each file has everything necessary to play its part efficiently in fact this disposition is so easy to understand that no one who can distinguish one human being from another could fail to follow it one set have the privilege of leaders the other the duty of followers 
the evolution orders by which greater depth or shallowness is given to the battle line are given by word of mouth by the inamotarch or commander of the section who plays the part of the herald and they cannot be mistaken none of these maneuvers presents any difficulty whatsoever to the understanding but when it comes to their ability to do battle equally well in spite of some confusion which has been set up and whatever the chapter of accidents may confront them with i admit that the tactics here are not so easy to understand except for people trained under the laws of lycurgus even movements which an instructor in heavy armed warfare might look upon as difficult are performed by the lacedaemonians with utmost ease thus the troops we will suppose are marching in column one section of a company is of course stepping up behind another from the rear now if at such a moment a hostile force appears in front in battle order the word is passed down to the commander of each section deploy into line to the left and so throughout the whole length of the column until the line is formed facing the enemy or supposing while in this position an enemy appears in the rear each line performs a counter march with the effect of bringing the best men face to face with the enemy all along the line as to the point that the leader previously on the right finds himself now on the left they do not consider that they are necessarily losers thereby but as it may turn out even gainers if for instance the enemy attempted to turn their flank he would find himself wrapping round not their exposed but their shielded flank or if for any reason it be thought advisable for the general to keep the right wing they turn the corps about and counter march by ranks until the leader is on the right and the rear rank on the left or again supposing a division of the enemy appears on the right whilst they are marching in column they have nothing further to do but to wheel each company to the right like a trireme prow forward to meet the enemy and thus the rear company again finds itself on the right if however the enemy should attack on the left either they will not allow of that and push him aside or else they wheel their companies to the left to face the antagonist and thus the rear company once more falls into position on the left part twelve i will now speak of the mode of encampment sanctioned by the regulation of lycurgus to avoid the waste incidental to the angles of a square the encampment according to him should be circular except where there was the security of a hill or fortification or where they had a river in their rear he had sentinels posted during the day along the place of arms and facing inwards since they are appointed not so much for the sake of the enemy but as to keep an eye on friends the enemy is sufficiently watched by mounted troopers perched on various points commanding the widest prospect to guard against hostile approach by night sentinel duty according to the ordinance was performed by the skidite outside the main body at the present time the rule is so far modified that the duty is entrusted to foreigners if there be a foreign contingent present with a leaven of spartans themselves to keep them company the custom of always taking their spears with them when they go their rounds must certainly be attributed to the same cause which makes them exclude their slaves from the place of arms nor need we be surprised if when retiring for necessary purposes they only withdraw just far enough from one another or from the place of arms itself not to create annoyance the need of precaution is the whole explanation the frequency with which they change their encampments is another point it is done quite as much for the sake of benefiting their friends as of annoying their enemies further the law enjoins upon all lacedaemonians during the whole period of an expedition the constant practice of gymnastic exercises whereby their pride in themselves is increased and they appear freer and of a more liberal aspect than the rest of the world the walk and the running ground must not exceed in length the space covered by a regimental division 
so that no one may find himself far from his own stand of arms. After the gymnastic exercises, the senior pole march gives the order, by herald, to be seated. This serves all the purposes of an inspection. After this, the order is given to get breakfast and for the outposts to be relieved. After this, again, come pastimes and relaxations before the evening exercises, after which the herald's cry is heard to take the evening meal. When they have sung a hymn to the gods to whom the offerings of a happy omen have been performed, the final order, retire to rest at the place of arms, is given. If the story is a little long, the reader must not be surprised, since it would be difficult to find any point in military matters omitted by the Lacedaemonians which seems to demand attention. Part 13 I will now give a detailed account of the power and privilege assigned by Lysurgis to the king during a campaign. To begin with, so long as he is on active service, the state maintains the king and those with him. The pole marches mess with him and share his quarters, so that by dint of constant intercourse they may be all the better able to consult in common in case of need. Besides the pole march, three other members of the peers share the royal quarters, mess, etc., the duty of these is to attend to all matters of commissariat, in order that the king and the rest may have unbroken leisure to attend to affairs of actual warfare. But I will resume at a somewhat higher point, and describe the manner in which the king sets out on an expedition. As a preliminary step, before leaving home, he offers sacrifice, in company with his staff, to Zeus Agitor, the leader, and if the victims prove favorable then and there, the priest, who bears the sacred fire, takes thereof from off the altar and leads the way to the boundaries of the land. Here, for the second time, the king does sacrifice to Zeus and Athena, and as soon as the offerings are accepted by those two divinities, he steps across the boundaries of the land. And all the while the fire from those sacrifices leads the way, and is never suffered to go out. Behind follow beasts for sacrifice of every sort. Invariably, when he offers sacrifice, the king begins the work in the gloaming ere the day has broken, being minded to anticipate the good will of the god. And round about the place of sacrifice are present the pole marches and captains, the lieutenants and sub-lieutenants, with the commandants of the baggage train and any general of the states who may care to assist. There, too, are to be seen two of the ephors, who neither meddle nor make, save only at the summons of the king. Yet have they their eyes fixed on the proceedings of each one there, and keep all in order, as may well be guessed. When the sacrifices are accomplished, the king summons all and issues his orders as to what has to be done. And all with such method that, to witness the proceedings, you might fairly suppose the rest of the world to be but bungling experimenters, and the Lacedaemonians alone true handicraftsmen in the art of soldiering. Anon, the king puts himself at the head of the troops, and if no enemy appears, he heads the line of march, no one preceding him except the Scirite, and the mounted troops exploring in front. If, however, there is any reason to anticipate a battle, the king takes the leading column of the first army corps and wheels to the right until he has got into position with two army corps and two generals of division on either flank. The disposition of the supports is assigned to the eldest of the royal council, or staff corps, acting as brigadier, the staff consisting of all peers who share the royal mess and quarters, with the soothsayers, surgeons, and pipers, whose place is in the front of the troops, with, finally, any volunteers who happen to be present, so that there is no check or hesitation in anything to be done, every contingency is provided for. The following details also seem to me of high utility among the inventions of Lysurgis, with a view to the final arbitrament of battle. 
Whensoever, the enemy being now close enough to watch the proceedings, the goat is sacrificed, then, says the law, let all the pipers in their places play upon the pipes, and let every Lacedaemonian don a wreath. Then, too, so runs the order, let the shields be brightly polished. The privilege is accorded to the young man to enter battle with his long locks combed. To be of cheery countenance, that, too, is of good repute. Onward they pass the word of command to the subaltern, in command of his section, since it is impossible to hear along the whole of each section from the particular subaltern posted on the outside. It devolves, finally, on the pole march to see that all goes well. When the right moment for encamping has come, the king is responsible for that and has to point out the proper place. The dispatch of emissaries, however, whether to friends or to foes, is not the king's affair. Petitioners in general wishing to transact anything treat in the first instance with the king. If the case concerns some point of justice, the king dispatches the petitioner to the Helanodakai, who form the court-martial, if of money to the paymasters. If the petitioner brings booty, he is sent off to the Lapuropoli, or sellers of spoil. This being the mode of procedure, no other duty is left to the king whilst he is on active service except to play the part of priest in matters concerning the gods and of commander-in-chief in his relationship to men. Part 14 Now, if the question be put to me, do you maintain that the laws of Lysurgis remain still to this day unchanged? That indeed is an assertion which I should no longer venture to maintain, knowing as I do that in former times the Lacedaemonians preferred to live at home on moderate means, content to associate exclusively with themselves rather than to play the part of governor-general in foreign states and to be corrupted by flattery. Knowing further, as I do, that formerly they dreaded to be detected in the possession of gold, whereas nowadays there are not a few who make it their glory and their boast to be possessed of it. I am well aware that in former days alien acts were put in force for this very object. To live abroad was not allowed. And why? Simply in order that the citizens of Sparta might not take the infection of dishonesty and light living from foreigners, whereas now I am very well aware that those who are reputed to be leading citizens have but one ambition, and that is to live to the end of their days as governors-general on a foreign soil. The days were when their sole anxiety was to fit themselves to lead the rest of Hellas. But nowadays they concern themselves much more to wield command than to be fit themselves to rule. And so it has come to pass that, whereas in old days the states of Hellas flocked to Lacedaemon, seeking her leadership against the supposed wrongdoer, now numbers are inviting one another to prevent the Lacedaemonians again recovering their empire. Yet, if they have incurred all these reproaches, we need not wonder, seeing that they are so plainly disobedient to the god himself, and to the laws of their own lawgiver, Lysurgis. Part 15 I wish to explain with sufficient detail the nature of the covenant between king and state as instituted by Lysurgis. For this, I take, is the sole type of rule which still preserves the original form in which it was first established, whereas other constitutions will be found either to have been already modified or else to be still undergoing modifications at this moment. Lysurgis laid it down as law that the king shall offer, in behalf of the state, all public sacrifices, as being himself of divine descent, and whithersoever the state shall dispatch her armies, the king shall take the lead. He granted him to receive honorary gifts of the things offered in sacrifice, and he appointed him choice lands in many of the provincial cities, enough to satisfy moderate needs without excess wealth. And in order that the kings also might camp and mess in public, 
he appointed them public quarters and he honored them with a double portion each at the evening meal not in order that they might actually eat twice as much as others but that the king might have wherewithal to honor whomsoever he desired he also granted as a gift to each of the two kings to choose two messmates which same are called pathoi he also granted them to receive out of every litter of swine one pig so that the king might never be at a loss for victims if in aught he wished to consult the gods close by the palace a lake affords an unrestricted supply of water and how useful that is for various purposes they best can tell who lack the luxury more so all rise from their seats to give place to the king save only that the ephors rise not from their thrones of office monthly they exchange oaths the ephors in behalf of the state the king himself in his own behalf and this is the oath on the king's part i will exercise my kingship in accordance with the established laws of the state and on the part of the state the oath runs so long as he who exercises kingship shall abide by his oaths we will not suffer his kingdom to be shaken these then are the honors bestowed upon the king during his lifetime at home honors by no means much exceeding those of private citizens since the lawgiver was minded neither to suggest to the kings the pride of the despotic monarch nor on the other hand to engender in the heart of the citizen envy of their power as to those other honors which are given to the king at his death the laws of lycurgus would seem plainly to signify hereby that these kings of lacedaemon are not mere mortals but heroic beings and that is why they are preferred in honor End of Parts 8 through 15. End of The Polity of the Lacedaemonians.